On November 10th, 1985, a hunter out in Allenstown, New Hampshire, made a startling discovery while out in Bearbrook State Park. Out in the forest, the hunter came across what looked like an old steel oil drum, something that really had no business being out in the middle of a forest. And when he opened it up, he didn't find anything that should have been out in the forest either. Cut up into pieces and wrapped up in plastic bags were the skeletal remains of two people. The hunter immediately reported this finding to the police and they quickly swarmed the area, looking for any clues that could explain what had happened to these people and who they were so that they could notify their families. But one of the first things they found out was only the first of many twists and turns in a very long case. One of the skeletal remains belonged to a young woman, but the other belonged to a little girl, possibly somewhere between the ages of 8 and 10 years old. Both of them had died from blunt force trauma before their bodies had been dismembered, stuffed inside the oil drum and then dumped in the Bearbrook Forest sometime between 1977 and 1985. The terrible discovery that one of the victims had only been a child spurred the investigation on, but with very little physical remains to work with and nothing else discovered at the crime scene, the investigation quickly ran into major difficulties. The trail went cold and investigators were left with few other options than to close the case and hope that something new would come up further down the line or someone would come forward and help them to find out more. With no known family to send them back to, the two victims were buried in a nearby cemetery with a tombstone that simply read, Here lies the mortal remains known only to God of a woman aged 22 to 33 and a girl child aged 8 to 10. Their slain bodies were found on November 10th, 1985 in Bearbrook State Park. May their souls find peace in God's loving care. With nothing but that tombstone left behind to remember them by, the case and the victims fell into obscurity. But another discovery sprang this case wide open in May of 2000, 15 years after the two bodies had first been found. In exactly the same area of that forest in Bearbrook State Park, another steel oil drum was discovered, and inside that were two more bodies. This drum had the skeletonized remains of two more children who had also died due to blunt force trauma, immediately reminding investigators of the two other victims they'd previously found. In the wake of this new discovery, the investigators were then faced with many questions, but one of the first ones they had to answer was how they could have missed that second drum with two more victims inside it all those years ago. They quickly explained that the second drum had been left outside of the initial crime scene created by the first drum, and then they got right into trying to solve this case with the new information they'd gathered from the second finding. Using new technologies, investigators were able to glean a bit more information about all of the victims. They still couldn't determine an exact age for the woman, but they could say that they believed she had someone in her family tree who was Native American. Going off of her genes, they were able to say that she had curly or at least wavy brown hair and stood at about 5 foot 2 inches or 1.57 meters tall. She'd had a lot of work done to her teeth and had multiple fillings with three teeth having been pulled out, something that police hoped would help identify her if they could narrow down their search just a little bit more. As for the girl who'd been found inside the drum with her, investigators were able to say that she showed signs of suffering from pneumonia, something that they also hoped would help identify her if they got a match in a medical or hospital record. She had two earrings in each ear, stood at approximately 4 feet 3 inches or 1.3 meters tall, with the same either curly or wavy hair as the woman she'd been found with, and she had a gap between her two front teeth. The other two children were determined to be younger than the first one who'd been discovered. 
Investigators put the middle girl at being somewhere between two and four years old, and she also had a gap between her two front teeth and had brown hair. She also had an overbite, which investigators said would probably be noticeable. The youngest child was only a toddler, and investigators believe that she was only somewhere between one and three years old when she'd been murdered. They were able to say that she had either blonde or very light brown hair, and she also had a gap between her front teeth, just like the other two. They had all been killed around the same time, and they had all been killed in the same way. All of their bodies had been dismembered, put into steel drums and dumped in the same place in the forest, leading investigators to believe that it was the same person who had killed all four victims. But all of this new information did nothing to tell investigators who that killer actually was and who the victims were before they had been killed. It was another 14 years before anyone was able to find out anything new about the case, and then what they did find wasn't exactly unexpected news. Using DNA evidence, the authorities first announced that the four victims were maternally related, meaning that they either all shared the same mother or the woman was either the girl's aunt or mother. But within a year of this announcement, investigators came out and officially announced that the woman had been the mother of at least two of the girls. Again, this wasn't unexpected news, but DNA and forensic evidence finally gave investigators a bit more to work with. They also uncovered evidence that proved that the woman and the girls had been living in the northeastern United States, probably in the exact same area they'd been found in, somewhere between two weeks to three months prior to their murder, meaning that the investigators finally had a solid location to start looking at missing persons reports. And in January 2017, we were finally given a name in connection to this case when the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children announced that a man going by the name of Robert Evans had been determined to be the father of the middle daughter, but was otherwise not biologically related to any of the other victims. The authorities then later announced that they believed that Robert Evans had actually been the one to have murdered all the victims, but that wasn't exactly the clean resolution to the case that it may sound as at first. Up until 2010, Robert Evans had been in custody, serving a sentence for the murder and dismemberment of his wife, Yun Soon Yun, but the investigation into the murder and dismemberment of the four other victims then hit an unexpected snag. Robert Evans was just an alias, and investigators hadn't been able to retrieve Robert's real identity out of him before he died in prison in December of 2010. They could first trace Robert Evans' name back to when he'd been in jail for theft in the early 1990s, but before that, Robert had been going by the name Jerry Mockerman. He'd been in jail as Jerry for driving a stolen vehicle, drunk driving and endangering a child. The child in this case had been a young girl named Lisa, and Jerry had claimed to be her father before he'd abandoned her at a park and had just driven away. But when Jerry, then Robert, had been arrested for murdering and dismembering his wife, Yun Soon Yun, he'd actually been going by the name of Lawrence Vanner, only further confusing the investigators and muddling the waters again. Lawrence went against the evidence of his attorneys in court and pleaded guilty to Yun Soon's murder, which then led investigators to use his DNA to confirm that he'd actually been Jerry Mockerman, thinking that they would then find out that he had actually been Lisa's father, but the case took another turn. DNA evidence proved that Jerry was not actually Lisa's father, and Lisa, who was an adult by then, realised that she had no idea who her actual parents were. She sent in a sample of her DNA to an Ancestry website and got a match for a woman called Denise Bodan, who'd been reported missing with her young daughter back in 1981. The match couldn't say what had happened to Denise, who was still officially missing, but Denise had only one other daughter and when DNA confirmed that Denise had actually been Lisa's mother, Lisa found out that her real name was actually Dawn. But how did Jerry have Dawn and where was Denise? Investigators had very little to work with once again, but what they were able to find out from the missing persons reports was that Denise and Dawn had gone missing while they'd been living with a man named Robert Evans. Somehow the investigation had come full circle and the investigators were still no closer to finding out Robert's real identity. 
Not knowing what else to do, they released footage of Robert Evans in 2017 that showed him while he was being interrogated by the police, and then just two months later, they had a name. After seeing the footage, a man came forward and provided the investigators with a DNA sample, proving once and for all that Robert Evans had actually been his father, and his father's name had been Terry Peter Rasmussen. Terry Rasmussen was born in Denver, Colorado in 1943, and by 1969 he was married with four children and living in Redwood City, California. By 1973, his wife had filed for divorce, and by 1974, he was out of his first family's lives and gone for good. They'd last seen him around Christmas of that year, but none of them had any idea where he'd gone, or that he'd turned out to have been a murderer. With Robert's identity now confirmed to be Terry Peter Rasmussen, the investigators finally had their killer, one that was nicknamed the Chameleon Killer for all of the different identities he'd used over the decades, but they were actually nowhere closer to figuring out who the four bodies in the steel drums had been before they'd come to know Terry. A year after the killer had been officially named, New Hampshire Public Radio did a podcast called Bear Brook, bringing to light the strange and almost unique aspects of the case that had an identified killer but unidentified victims, and it was like striking a match. The case went cold from being almost like a side note in investigation history to exploding all over the internet, with hundreds of people using their free time to scour records for any clues that could lead to the names of the victims. One of those online researchers, a 34-year-old librarian from Connecticut called Becky Heath, uncovered a missing persons poster for someone looking for their missing half-sister named Sarah McWaters, and something seemed to click. And Sarah McWaters had been only one member of a family, a family that was made up of her, her older sister, Marie Elizabeth Vaughan, and their mother, Marlies Honeychurch. And to top it all off, all three members of this family were actually missing. Feeling like she was onto something, Becky kept digging and eventually found out that Marlies had last been seen with a man before she and her children had gone missing. And that man was called Terry Rasmussen. With that final name tying them together, Becky called her tip into the police, and DNA evidence then proved that the toddler found in the second drum was in fact Sarah McWaters. The eldest daughter in the steel drum was Marie Elizabeth Vaughan, and the woman had been their mother, Marlies Honeychurch, and they were all officially named as three out of the four victims in June of 2019. Years and years of investigating and collaborating finally gave names back to three people. But there is still one more question to solve in this case, and it has everything to do with the identity of the fourth victim. It's another strange situation because we know that little Bear Brook Jane Doe was Terry Rasmussen's biological daughter, but we don't know the identity of her mother. We know who her half-siblings were, and we know her approximate age, but how could we still be missing a name after uncovering all of this? Bearbrook Jane Doe was between the ages of just two and four years old when she was found deceased in May of 2000. She was primarily of Caucasian origins, though DNA testing revealed she had a small amount of Asian, African and Native American ancestry. She stood between 3 feet 3 and 3 feet 9 inches tall, had light brown, slightly wavy hair, measuring approximately 5 inches, and she was possibly anemic, based on the examination of her bones. She also had an overbite, which may have been noticeable in life. Her DNA is available for comparison. Investigators have thus far been unable to find out who Jane Doe's mother was. She could have possibly been another victim of Terry Rasmussen, but we don't know that for sure. Until DNA gives us those answers, it seems unlikely that we will know the true identity of Bearbrook Jane Doe. Investigators are still searching for these answers, looking for that final piece of the puzzle that will make everything click and put this case 
to bed after decades of waiting and hoping to be able to lay the last remaining victim of the Bearbrook murders to rest with her family by her side.